Hello and um, welcome to the third part of the lecture. Um, so um, before this, um, you should have watched Hans Rosling's um, excellent tech talk on um, global poverty and development. Um, so we are coming back to this familiar side, slides to remind you that uh, what we are we have been discussing during this lecture um, are things that were occurring during the 1970s and 1980s. Um, so we were talking about um, um, the basic needs approach and the capability approach, which um, uh, were things that are being propagated during the 1970s and also the 1980s. And also um, related to um, the basic needs approach and capability approach is the participatory and inclusive development approaches, which is what I will be focusing um, during this part of the lecture. Um, so the participatory approach to development um, really has increased popularity since 1970s. And as I say, it's part of the response, um, um, a natural follow up sort of to the basic needs and the capability approach. Because if you remember, the basic needs approach actually um, say that um, one of its benefits is its ability to mobilize local resources, such as, um, you know, um, training local health workers to support um, the health access of um, um, different communities. And we talk about how capability approach um, is really focusing on um, empowerment and also deliberation on what are the um, um, good um, development approaches for different cultural contexts. So, um, so um, participatory approach um, has um, planner-centered benefits. Um, what it means here is like for the people who plan development, um, it can actually um, improve ownerships. Also, it is supposed to be more efficient because um, the local people will take ownership and therefore share some of the responsibility and um, resources um, um, for, for the project. And then it is appealing to the donors because um, this is morally appealing and it also has efficiency purposes. And then um, it also has people-centered benefits. Um, so some people would argue that um, there is an intrinsic value in participatory approaches. It is part of a manifestation of democracy. And then um, participatory approach um, can enhance um, local capacity and empowerment um, and also raise collective consciousness um, on, on a certain issues. Um, but um, I have asked you to read um, an article by Chenner um, uh, about um, participatory approach of non-formal education program in Burkina Faso. And you can see that um, there, is, uh, there are a lot of issues in trying to operationalize um, participatory approaches. For example, um, there have always been donors agenda underlying all development interventions. Um, so even though um, you're supposed to um, ask uh, what are the local needs, but if you're funded by, for example, um, WHO on health um, related interventions, you cannot really accommodate local needs that ask you to um, provide for education, for example. And if you are um, from UNICEF, for example, who are trying to um, promote formal education um, for children, you cannot really accommodate um, local um, demands to build a toilet, for example, unless it is a toilet being built inside a school. So um, this donors agencies um, and development organizations, international NGOs have been existing since the 1950s and 1960s. So, um, and these agencies, they have already established some kind of expertise or um, specialized functions. Um, they can really only fund um, some kind of projects that are related to their mandate. Um, so in this case, um, there will always be a conflict between donors' agendas and local needs. And second problem here is the power relations between implementers and beneficiaries. So a lot of um, people who um, implement development projects, they are, um, especially the local people, they, they are um, people who just gained this status not long ago. So for example, maybe one or two generations ago, um, they are also from rural areas. They are also um, from um, um, poor communities who need this kind of development. So once they reach a, a different status with a certain education qualifications and be employed in this um, 
development organizations as professionals, um, there is a tendency for them to want to maintain this status or want to believe that um, they have better knowledge or at least um, um, better access to power than, than, um, than um, the poor people or the poor communities that they are supposed to help. So um, there's this power relations uh, between the implementers and beneficiaries that kind of obstruct um, uh, obstruct true participatory approaches because um, um, the implementers do not really want the beneficiaries to know too much because in that way um, the latter can challenge everything the former um, do and this is threatening to the former security um, job security particularly and also their claims towards expertise or education or qualifications. And then um, also um, the participatory approach um, did not happen in a vacuum, right? Um, it happens after two or three decades of development interventions. And before um, the participatory approaches, a lot of the development interventions are were top down and expert led. So um, the beneficiaries who had experiences with these previous approaches will not suddenly um, um, adjust to a different mode by um, expressing what they really want. Usually the approaches are to go along with um, whatever is being suggested um, by the um, external planner and with the hope that um, after giving corporations to whatever they want to do, um, they could eventually um, gain some benefits that they want um, on, on a separate agenda. So um, uh, all this has made um, the historical context, the social context, have made um, participatory approaches really difficult to operationalize. Um, so um, in this article, Michena also shared with us several previous studies on participation. So people immediately realized that um, there are different levels of participation, even though all can be nominally called participation. Uh, for example, um, Dessler and Sock actually um, talks about two kinds of participation. The first one is a genuine participation, uh, which involves empowerment and corporations of people. Um, and also um, there's this, what is called pseudo participation, um, pseudo participation, which um, uh, was divided into existentialism and domestication. So, um, for domestication, for example, you probably are just informing people what are you going to do, or maybe you sort of um, manipulate them and um, so that they can agree with what do you plan to do in their communities. So this can be also a kind of participation um, nominally. And then um, existentialism is, you know, um, just consulting them, um, what do they think, uh, without necessarily incorporating their opinions as the central planning framework. Right? And then um, there was this very famous book that came out in 2001. Um, the title is um, Provoking. Um, it's called Participation, the New Tyranny. It's by um, Cook and Kotari. Um, so basically, um, Cook and Kotari is trying to be um, exactly provocative. Um, um, to talk about how um, participatory approaches can be a new tyranny of development because as they observe in the development field, um, one can see that even in projects that claim to be participatory, they observe the continued dominance of aid funders. Um, so it is always the funders, the donors, who already decided the major agenda. Um, so for example, I used to work in UNESCO and the UNESCO mandate is to really work on non-formal education. Um, so as a result, we cannot really work on whatever um, things that people think they need from us. For example, one of them, um, one of the um, local people that uh, has approached me to talk about how they want to establish um, a museum on local culture. And um, even though UNESCO has um, cultural units, uh, my culture unit con um, colleague also um, haven't received any mandate to um, um, projects like museum establishments. Right, so um, it is really limited in terms of what kind of participatory approach that we can take because of the bureaucratic and historical limitations of the organizations. And, and then um, also a lot of this participation 
contradictory approaches actually obscure local power differentials. Because imagine if you don't know anything about local community, and then you go in and then you ask the community to get around and then you start asking their opinions. So what usually end up happening is if it's a community with very um, um, hierarchical structures and with big local power differentials, it is the powerful people, uh, maybe older male who will speak out and tell you what they want. Um, in some part, um, in some parts of the world, women will just keep quiet because they were not supposed to um, tell things uh, in a public manner. So, um, participatory approaches that haven't understood this context um, before going in can uh, end up obscuring local power differentials. You can end up only listening um, to the opinions or needs of the powerful people locally. Um, and as a result, actually exacerbate um, the power relations because now you are um, giving more benefits to the powerful people and um, continue to neglect um, the weakest or the poorest sections of the community. And then participation also becomes a rhetoric, a rhetoric for legitimacy, which also blocks other ways of doing development um, because um, participatory is such an appealing concept that um, uh, as long as all the development reports and implementers are using this term in their reports, um, people tend to be happy about it and people tend to feel that, okay, we are doing this um, the best way that we can. So, I think a simple conclusion that I can give here is that um, capability approach or, or human development approach in general is really not easy to operationalize in the complex world where uh, we have already existing history and existing organization as existing key actors in the international development field. Okay, so now um, before I end this lecture, I want to bring you to look at the latest um, development approach, which is the multidimensional poverty approach, um, which has been used by the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, since 2010. And um, so the multidimensional poverty approach is really also a continuation of the acknowledgement that um, economic growth and income is not the only way to tackle um, poverty problem. Um, this is a 2018 um, methodology or indicators for multidimensional poverty um, measurement by the UNDP. So you can see that um, these are the indicators. That, um, the major indicators are health, education, and standard of living. So under health, you have nutrition, child mortality, and um, education years of skill years of schooling and school attendance and then i was looking at standard of living and and there were some indicators that really struck me as weird and not convincing and um, um potentially problematic for example um cooking fuel the household cooks with dung wood charcoal or coal i i feel to understand how this alone is um uh, dimensions of poverty, right? Um, so I don't necessarily think cooking with wood um, or agricultural residues, um, basically non-gas cylinder cooking, is um, is the manifestation of poverty. Um, for me, that's that's uh, the most natural way of using our uh, surrounding natural resources for cooking. Even though I understand that um, um, some kind of open fire cooking is actually detrimental to health and also another question i have is about housing um, it says here that housing materials for at least one of roof walls and floors are, in that, are inadequate the floor of natural materials or the roof or walls out of natural or rudimentary materials this is really interesting because if you're aware also, if you're aware of another literature, which is um, earthquake resistant buildings using local materials, you will see that um, a lot of um, um, local um, building techniques can be very earthquake resistant. And, and um, in the whole green infrastructure or, or, or green um, technology field, um, one part of it is about how to use and source local material sustainability to um, build houses and build buildings. And also uh, about assets, the household does not own more than one 
of these assets, radio, TV, telephone, computer, animal, cat, bicycle, motorcycle, or refrigerator, does not own a car or truck. I think these are really sort of superficial indicators um, that probably establish using a very middle class or rich people perception of um, what is a good standard of living. If you have good view um, living in the mountains and you have a lot of activities throughout the days, why would you, what, why would you need a TV or a telephone? Um, so these are some of the indicators that I feel are quite problematic. Um, and I, I don't know whether you have the same opinions as I do. Um, so uh, my question is here is, to what extent does the uh, multi-dimensional poverty index reflect the basic needs or capability approach? So um, if you look back uh, onto this diagram and, and, and um, if you can look at it and tell me what do you think um, are ideas that are being sourced from the basic needs or capability approach? Um, and um, do you feel the indicators are appropriate? Um, do you have the same feelings that I had um, that I just explained to you? Or maybe there are some other indicators that you have some opinions about. So um, um, this is very relevant because this is basically um, it's the same index that's being used in UNDP in reporting our progress towards um, sustainable development goals. Um, okay, and, and so this is the end of our lecture 4.5. And thank you so much for listening to it.